welcome back everyone. Uh, we've got a, a new panel now um, uh, to canvas uh, some of the issues that were raised this morning by Tina in her talk, um, but also uh, to no doubt deal with plenty of others as well. So really looking forward to this. Um, we, we've asked each of the panel members, uh, to support those who haven't, I think Tina's have been given an exemption from this one, but uh, each of the panel, other panel members to speak for about five minutes each, and then we'll open the session <laughs> to uh, Jim's uh, very quickly editing his uh, presentation as well. well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then we'll go to a, a discussion session and, and further opportunities for, for questions and answers. Um, so look, I'll just briefly introduce um, each of the four speakers. Uh, Professor Joanne Tompkins is Executive Director uh, for Humanities and Creative Arts at the Australian Research Council. Um, Joanne's research expertise lies in humanities and creative arts, particularly in spatial theories and virtual reality, multicultural theories and drama, intercultural performance and feminist performance. Um, her research has assisted the development of cultural spaces for, for theatres, galleries and museums through 3D visualisation and modelling of theatre spaces and um, you know, she, she has great experience as, as both an author and a journal editor. Roxanne Missingham uh, is the University Librarian, Chief Scholarly Information Services at the Australian National University. She is responsible for libraries, archives, and very pertinently today, ANU Press, um, records, privacy, and copyright. Before joining the university, Roxanne spent over six years at the Parliamentary Library here in Canberra, providing research and information services to members of Parliament. She's been at the forefront of developments in digital libraries and information access, um, previously president of the Australian Library and Information Association. Roxanne is now a member of the board of the Council of Australian University Librarians. Thirdly, Professor James Fox. Um, uh, Jim is, um, in his own words, an old academic. Um, he has been at the ANU for 44 years. Um, to date, he has supervised 65 ANU PhD theses, over 40 of which have so far been published as books. He himself has published with leading international academic publishers such as Harvard University Press, Cambridge University Press, Routledge, and a variety of other presses. And of course, many of you will also know Jim as um, you know, really one of the, the, the major figures in ANU Press, and uh, as he puts it, he now prefers to publish with the ANU Press. Glad to hear it. And fourthly, Do Dr Elizabeth Ganter, the ANU. Uh, Elizabeth completed her PhD on Indigenous experiences of representative bureaucracy with the ANU History Program uh, in 2010. After that, she returned to her Northern Territory government career while keeping an eye out for a role that crossed over into academia. This eventually came in the form of a visiting fellowship at the Centre for Aboriginal Economic Policy Research here at the ANU to publish her thesis as a book. Elizabeth's book, Reluctant Representatives, Blackfellow Bureaucrats Speak in Australia's North, is a result of three years of evenings and weekends, don't we know about that process, uh, and several small but value blocks, valuable blocks of time supported by her then employer, the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet in Canberra. And, uh, her book was published by the ANU Press in 2016. So, um, I'll, I'll um, now invite um, Joanne to, uh, to say her five minutes. Would you like to come up? You've got a microphone here, Joanne, so it might be a bit easier, I think. That's working. Thanks very much, Frank, and thanks for the invitation to, um, to be here today. So I'm just going to make four points. Um, and the first one, in full disclosure, I did not publish my PhD as a book. Um, towards the end of my PhD, my thinking was moving on, uh, and I focused on the moving on project rather than um, turning the PhD into a book. I don't have any regrets. I think if I'd gone back to think about publishing it even four or five years later, as I said, my thinking had moved on and I wanted to be moving on into other directions. I'm not sure it would have made a particularly good book. So um, I think, though, um, it does depend on where you do a PhD, and I mean what country, not what university whether or not uh, there is an increased likelihood of your, your thesis turning into a book. Um, in the US, for, for instance, um, less 
so of the UK, a lot of people, especially at the top end universities, are devising a PhD project from day one so that it can get examined and turned into a book. That's, that takes a particular focus, it takes a particular interest in the topic, and it takes a particular relationship between student and um, a supervisor. That's not something that everybody could necessarily do, but you will, in, around the world, you will see pressure towards that direction. Um, now, fast forward to my time at the ARC, which is what I want to focus on the most here. Um, times have changed from when I didn't turn my PhD into a book, which was some time ago now. Um, as you would all know, the ARC receives only a tiny portion of federal dollars, and we get many more projects, fantastic research projects, coming through our doors than we can fund. So we have to make really difficult decisions. And one of the decisions for the disciplines that we're involved in, and I'm thinking specifically of those that um, uh, where the book is important, one of those decisions that often gets made for a DECRA application, the um, postdoc scheme, is do they have a book? If they have a book, then it, it's likely that their application will stand a better chance of remaining in the if they don't have a book in a book discipline, chances are that it will go into the disappointment pile. So it's not because the book is the biggest and the most important thing. It's that the book is a marker of bankability, of reliability, of, of um, uh, some form of quality. Now, by that I mean that the applicant is <coughs> capable of doing independent work, not just the PhD, because the PhD is done under supervision, and that an independent entity, that is the press, has decided that they are also bankable. So that's, that's a reality of the competitive nature of the ARC. It doesn't translate that if you don't have a book, you will never get a DECRA and vice versa as well. But that is one of the markers that we, um, we tend to look at. Um, now, if you don't have a book, there may be multiple ways in which you can create a narrative about your experiences that make your uh, profile equivalent to having a so that is something that is worth discussing with a supervisor and with senior people in the field. Have you published all of the chapters from your thesis in different outlets that help you tell a story? For instance, the kind of story that says, now my work is being read in multiple disciplines in multiple countries from different perspectives. That's the kind of narrative that you can make work for you. You may have published things outside of even the topic of your thesis, other sorts of things, possibly from a master's or even honors, or um, offcuts from the thesis, the things that, were, that end up on the floor that don't make it into the thesis, but that can take you into a different direction. Any of those sorts of things that might help present you as bankable. Um, and I guess the um, one of the other things to say about um, uh, the DECRA idea is that if you're applying for a DECRA, um, the reason that bankability is so important is you're on your own. If you're applying as an early career researcher on a discovery grant or any of the other ones with other people, it's not quite as important that you've got a book or a book contract because there is a team and because there is the potential argument of your role in the team absolutely essential, and I will explain more about that afterwards if you like. Now, I just, uh, just a couple more points. I do want to say that a lot of, all of what I'm saying predates the, um, uh, the uh, push towards citations. Now, as we all know, um, humanities um, and to some extent social science research doesn't in books doesn't get picked up by the citation index people anywhere near as much as um, uh, 
articles do. So as we have to push more towards citations, since Haas ends up following the STEM model, it may be that this focus on the book over time will change. So I'm just putting that provocation out there. The next point is that time? Oh, no. No? Oh, okay. um, the next point um, in the context of ARC is that um, if you don't have a book and you feel you've got an excellent project and otherwise an excellent profile, remember that the ARC has the policy of rope. A research um, relative to opportunity and performance evidence. So if you haven't had a straightforward career, if you have had various kinds of impediments to your career or various slowdowns, whether it's raising a family or looking after aged parents or illness or whatever, um, uh, we do look upon your application with that in mind. So we are not assuming that if you are two years out of a PhD, you should have X amount of outputs. Uh, if you've got rope issues, we take X into consideration against um, what you've told us is, is relevant. Now, the last point I was going to make is actually here up on the screen now, so I will skip talking about this in any depth since um, you're going to hear about it at all. But from an ARC perspective and from research generally, I would absolutely agree with um, uh, this statement here, stay away from predatory publishing. And I'm sure Roxanne will say more about it later. I'll leave you to that. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Joanne. Thank so now I'll call Roxanne. Thank you. And I also think that's you. Yeah, that's my um, Let's uh, make sure you. Thanks, Jack. Oops. So thank you everyone for coming and thank you everyone who put this event together. It's very timely and um, do give us feedback at the end if there are other things you would like us to do to help understand how to, how to publish. A lot of work went into putting this event together to try and meet an immediate need. So uh, before I talk a little bit about predatory publishing, um, I just want to say well, what is a book that we're talking about in this context. If you have colleagues who are, who are PhD students in places like Germany, places like Sweden, their PhD has to be published as a book. So there are presses that are just set up in the countries where uh, a PhD has to be published and they literally publish the PhD. What we're talking about here is the Australian, US, UK approach and that is your PhD is an unpublished piece of major research work and a book is a commercial, uh, well a, a publication where it is reworked so that it stands alone as a monogram that is telling a story in a different way to the PhD which is a research output. So it's important just to think about that because sometimes you will see people have published books overseas from their PhDs and it will literally be their PhD but it's because of the legislative environment that they're in. So I just wanted to say a few words about predatory publishing and I did say how to save yourself from the bad guys because they are everywhere and you will be getting emails from them all the time inviting you to speak, inviting you to submit papers, inviting you to be guest editor and I get them to my privacy account because I'm the privacy officer and it says, Dear Privacy, we realise you are an expert in the field of artificial intelligence and I go, what? How on earth did you get this email address? But they're out there and it's really important to think about it to save your reputation and career. So predatory publishing, the, they publish counterfeit journals, counterfeit books and they basically aim to dupe researchers, take your money for an open access publication so there are huge companies like Omex in India set up to do this. So just in terms of what you should expect from publishing, particularly publishing your book, that it should contribute to your reputation, give you visibility in the professional community. Um, and we've already had a lot of talk about this. It's a recognition of your quality work and peer review is fundamental to that. And news. You wouldn't believe what happened. So a pair, Australian researchers are really enterprising. So they got an invitation to submit to the International Journal of Advanced Computing and literally it was called get off, 
get me off your fucking mailing list. <laughs> New York, University of California. <laughs> That's literally what it said. Repeated. They had two diagrams in it. <laughs> it was accepted. Twenty-four <laughs> hours. Two peer reviewers. The acceptance letter said your manuscript has been accepted with minor changes, no changes, for publication, uh, and said it was well aligned with. <laughs> what well, can you say? You know, there's nothing like enterprise research. And lo and behold, it was published. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's literally published. No, but it's science. For what? It's science. What? How can this happen? That's. I just wanted to show. This is why I wanted slides because you wouldn't believe it unless you saw it. But this is the sorts of people are out there. So they pocketed the money. I mean, eventually the article came out, but really, truly, <laughs> it is just what it's like. And they're smart. You know, they sent invitations, you know, privacy officer, whoever. This was to be as director. Of course, is this one about agriculture? I don't know, they're just so bizarre. They happen all the time. So just a couple of top tips. If you haven't heard about the General Law Conference and look, there's a whole lot happening where the names of these publishers and the names of journals are incredibly close <coughs> to journals that you will respect. Incredibly close. The Scottish Journal of Art and Culture is a predatory journal. You have to go to the web page, you have to drill down, you have to look at the articles. You can't even tell from them. I don't even know if the people who are on the board of directors are real or fantasy. Um, but most of the content is Nigeria. Of course. Uh, don't believe the website. Don't respond to unsolicited emails. Seek the views of your colleagues. Lots of different varieties of journals. And in fact, one that was published by Elsevier that was uh, a journal from, surprise, surprise, a pharmaceutical company. <laughs> surprise, surprise, lots of pseudo journals, masqueraders, false flags. But we have online tools in the university that will help you insights and if you want some training in that or advice ask your library staff member or ask your anyone in the research services division you can actually look up the journal see that they have genuine listings uh, genuine rankings we're there to help uh, there are some criteria around publishing ethics and you press five stars um, and again it's not just the, the predatory publishers that have been caught up in this, Springer and I, Triple E, had to remove more than 120 papers that were found to be computer generated. It's, a, you know, there are crocodiles out there trying to eat you and eat your research, so you do need to be careful. But I did want to end with this. So while it's a very serious business, citation metrics, ERA, we're all committed to it. This is one from a, a Comic, your impact factor <laughs> equals the number of times you are cited, number of times, <laughs> less the number of times you cite yourself, divided by not so articles you've written, copied and pasted, people you've pressured, you know, don't take it all too seriously and certainly don't despair with a rejection because many of the most fabulous um, pieces of research have suffered many rejections, so don't ever let it get you down. And in fact, I'm just trying to think of who I was listening to. Uh, a really eminent uh, lawyer at the graduation ceremonies who talked about, she's in academic, she started in academia, took her 250 job applications to get a job. And she's now employed by the UN, one of the most eminent civil rights lawyers. And she said, just persist. So don't let it get it down. Don't let it take you seriously, take it too seriously, but be very alert. If ever you have accidentally submitted a journal, article or submitted a book proposal and you, uh, you you realise this, come and see me. I've written threatening letters to publishers to get a new author's publications removed and I'm quite happy to go into bat for you with the support of the legal office who are also very helpful. So just remain alert. You can keep up to date. There's a very good think, check, submit guide online that's been produced by the publishers, the good quality publishers. Um, Keep writing, keep developing your proposals, and if you need assistance, the library is here. Those, that's my key messages, other than showing you that just incredible journal article. <laughs> Thanks,
Sam. Uh, it raises, I think, some we get a you know, sort of, uh, um, I guess, business as well. Businesses yeah, yeah. respond to markets, don't they? And so yeah. it's worth reflecting, isn't it, on you know, the market that universities have been complicit in creating for this sort of stuff too. But that's something for questions on. Jim, over to you. Oh, okay. okay. No, I've never managed to fit in anything in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me let me begin by saying that uh, there are, and it was Tina uh, and, and, and highlighted at the beginning, is that there are. I, I feel very strongly that you need to. If you've done all the work on the thesis, you should publish it. And there have been always the two strategies. The one, you mine your thesis for lots of articles and do that. And that's what I did, in fact, uh, with my thesis, because I had a disagreement with my, uh, a gentle disagreement with my supervisor about how I should really uh, do it. And then I went out and wrote the book I wanted to write. But um, most, uh, with my students, and I've had quite a few, as, as, as Frank has mentioned, I've, I've had quite a few students here, over 65 uh, PhD students at the ANU. And the overwhelming majority, my last count was 47. 47 uh, theses have been published from those things. Um, I'm in the field of anthropology, and I do feel there's more than just an academic pressure to do that. If you do field work, which is really important in a society that welcomes you, and that gives you the information, and that wants to, via, via you, achieve voice. And, and voice is a very complicated thing, but achieve voice, and you don't publish your thesis afterwards, you just leave it on the shelves, um, I think you failed in your obligation. Now, that's why I put a lot of pressure on my students, right from the beginning, and right from the beginning, I, I try to, get them to shape the thesis so that it will not take years and years to rework it. So I do believe, and I believe fairly strongly, that when you start a thesis, you have to have the book in mind. That's critical. That's critical. Um, so uh, that, that's the first thing. The second thing, you know, second point I want to make, and that was the one that, that Tina emphasized, I think, too, is that your supervisor is your first protocol. Your supervisor knows better than anyone else how you might turn that book, or that thesis into a book, how you might proceed. Now, one of the key things, and looking back over the, the number of students of mine who have published, one very important thing is our prestigious series. Um, people uh, do have, and our editors on prestigious series, and often, when you begin your thesis or working on your thesis, also think about what series in some prestigious outlet, what series your thesis might fit in. And I think that's one of the strategies that uh, a very large number of my students have, uh, have followed, putting it into an important the uh, series. Series change, some go out, uh, the editors change, some lose prestige, but the idea of a series is very important, whatever your field is. Um, another thing which has changed at the ANU, but one of the things that used to be a factor in at the ANU was we had three external examiners and the system was set up so that at the end of the process, you were able to make contact, or we urged the, the, the examiners to make contact with the, the examiners. And in many cases that I know, you, if your thesis is good, your examiners like it, you set up a correspondence with your thesis, not only do they help you get it published, because they're keen, they've said so in the examination, this is something that should be published, they are on your side, but often, and I've seen it happen with some of our students, is they've also gotten them for their first job. Uh, that's changed, it's now a much more secret process in the examination system. Um, there's less contact with examiners afterwards, uh, and I think that's, that's uh, uh, to the detriment of the PhD students, serious detriment to the PhD students. It wasn't that way um, uh, even 10 years ago. All right, um, the next thing I, I want to say is that 
I can just relate one experience, which actually was a, for me, a life-changing experience, but it's one that, you know, it just, when it dawned on me, I was, I was, I had published with Harvard, I had published with Rutledge, and then I was publishing with Cambridge, and I talked to the Cambridge editor uh, for the whole series within which this book was, was, was being published, and she told me, I suppose in confidence, she told me that none of the books in this series would be for more, they would not publish more than 300. Most publishers don't tell you how many books they're publishing. And they said only 300, and then they will remainder it. It was aimed for the libraries. Cambridge could be assured of so many, so many copies going to libraries. It was uh, unaffordable for me. It was 150 50 pounds at the time, and that was some time ago. Um, and I couldn't afford it, and I realized, why? Why would you publish and then have it remainder and only have 300 copies, even if it was, indeed it was in a very prestigious series. Now, in that case, later on, they republished it and continued on, but at, at, the, at the beginning, it seemed to me you're, you're almost self-defeating. Going for, quote, a very prestigious uh, press and prestigious uh, series, and it'll only be 300 in the remainder. Okay, so um, this is one of the things that, that pushed me towards uh, helping to establish the ANU Press, because the ANU Press operates very differently. And what's really important about the ANU Press is the fact that um, um, in a digital world, you have a world market. Now, last year, that meant about 3.1 million downloads from the ANU Press. That's a good number. That number will go up. And what it is, what it, the, the advantages that the, the big publishing companies once uh, had of selling to libraries is uh, the ANU has eclipsed that because almost all the ANU books are taken up by libraries around the world in the thousand, I don't know what the figure is, they're taken up and they're put on the catalog almost immediately. So you almost have immediate representation. But as Tina is experienced, what happens often and quite often is your book, as it becomes known, the numbers go up. The numbers go up and up and up as um, as time goes on. I just wanted to take, this is, this is one of my students' books. This is not one I would have picked to be a bestseller. Uh, but this book, uh, The Islamic Traditions of Chitterborn, published in the series, in the ANU Press series on Islam in Southeast Asia, is a super bestseller. Uh, for the last three years, um, it's on an ever, increasing trajectory. Um, this, I got the figures yesterday for this book, and it was, it's now over uh, 15,000, almost 16,000 in the last three years. But it's running at downloads of 700 to 800 a month. Now, that is impact. That's impact. So I think that's a very important thing. I take another book. This is the one that won the um, Ann Bates Prize in Anthropology. Uh, I supervise this one. This has only been out a year and a half, and it's just about at 4,000 downloads. This book parlayed the student into a fellowship in Kyoto. Um, he's now teaching in Japan. He's looking for other jobs. Um, but he is internationally recognized within a year and a half of the publication of his book. So these things can happen. Finally, I just mention, and you may, because you are a much more uh, savvy digital uh, generation uh, than, than someone like me, um, it's these things like having a DOI, for anything you publish, that's very, very important. The ANU Press has DOI now for almost all of its books. It's gone back to its old books, put DOIs on it. That increases visibility on the net. You should have, especially if you have a name like Fox, you should have an ORCID so that you're identified and, and differentiated from all the other foxes on the network. Um, but also, you should be aware there are a couple, and I checked my phone, I checked my phone to see um, I 
and this is only a few years ago, joined academia, academia.edu.com, okay? I joined that in order to communicate more with colleagues of mine in Eastern, Eastern Europe where I was finding it hard. Uh, but that's become an almost daily, uh, it works, I joined, it's very cheap to become a premier member, and you join, and they alert you. I've had two alerts today about who, who's reading what of my articles or what uh, is related to it. It's almost a continuing correspondence. And the other one, uh, which is probably bigger and more important, is ResearchGate. Uh, both of those in the digital world are very, very important. So I'll stop there. Didn't do five minutes, but uh, I apologize for going over that. Very well timed. We were joking down here that I guess that would be called the Fox Network. Just a thesis was enough, and this was in the end of the first draft of the book. 
plus the examiner's reports. Um, the second uh, prop I have, the second bit of raw material I have for this book um, was the structural edit by Dr. Francis Morphy, Caper's editorial advisor, who has both academic and publishing experience, um, which gave me broad brush, brush suggestions on emphasis and ordering. Um, pencil marks through the thesis, not lots of them. Um, um, for example, highlight the voices of my interviewees and keep only the relevant historical notes narrative, for example. The third, my third prop is this marvellous book um, that I can recommend to you called William Germano by William Germano um, from dissertation to book, which I read from cover to cover before starting. Um, there's also the five points of advice on Melbourne University Press's website, which might be something for ANU Press to think about. Fabulous five points of advice, five degrees, which I hope to just quickly tell you what they are, RE words um, at the end. Um, and you can find that by Google ter Googling turning your thesis into a book. And an unanticipated hospital stay with only a hard copy of my thesis and a pencil to keep me occupied. Not recommended for everyone, uh, but the point is not to dive onto the screen too soon. So I really, I really thought about it. Can I keep going? I've got a few more. Yeah, yes, sure. Yes, great. Let me talk. So, William Germano told me that turning your thesis into a book is not about reproducing the thesis, but about changing it into something else. With chapters like Getting Started Again, um, Germano really speaks to the postdoctoral psyche, and I, can't, I really can't recommend his book highly enough. My favourite chapter is called Making Prose Speak, where I learned my most profound lesson. I needed to find my author voice. That is, to be present in the text through the words and the structure, and not through distancing devices that I'd learned so well in my PhD, like the assertive pronouns I, we, or the author. Readers know it's a book. They know it has an author. They've read the title, your name, the back cover blurb, and the chapter headings. So through your words, the readers need to be taken along, amused, and immersed, was my, was my challenge and um, they need to be kept reading. So they, yeah, so they don't really need to be reminded that you exist and the book exists. It's all there. So unlike Tina's experience, I would say to, well, I, I, this is what I did, this is what I, the advice I had in these books and um, what I would recommend to others um, is be prepared for relentless self-editing. So not all of us write a book to start with. If you're not writing a book to start with, be prepared for relentless self-editing. Um, but the joy of it is, there's a real joy in this because you've actually done the work. There's not a single new piece of research in my book, none at all. It's just refreshed and revived and made into a communication tool. My work is, is now communicating. So the five Melbourne University Press Reads are uh, remove, reduce, refocus, re, re, remove, reorder, refocus, reduce, and rewrite. And they were all very invaluable to me. Um, the biggest one, remove academic, ac academic scaf scaffolding. Um, you know, makes it your first task to delete every single time your thesis explains what you're about to do. And everything single time it explains what you've just done. Instead, just do it. So um, the second point, I won't go through all of them, I'd love to. <laughs> um, reorganise, reorder. If there's anything left. So my biggest shock was in taking out the scaffolding. Oh my goodness, what have I got? Um, and so what I had then, turned, then I was just left communicating what I had and it was, it was such a nice feeling. Um, so if there's, any, if there's anything left, then introduce the most arresting aspects immediately. Um, in the thesis, it's, so it's not a criminal investigation. You know, we say we uh, and um, there's many different writing styles. This is a bit like it's what it's like in government. Say the point straight up. But in a book, um, introduce the most arresting aspects immediately. Start from the particular and work to the general, going back later for interpretation. Look, I won't keep going, but I, would, I just will say that um, I start the preface, which is the longest preface in human history, by the way. If you want to read all about me and how many people I put couldn't help thanking, read that. Um, and chapter one, with the voices of interviewees. 
And chapter one in particular, I commence with the quotation I spend the whole book unpicking. That is, and this is the quote, how can you make decisions about Aboriginal people when you can't even talk to the people you've got here that are black fellas? So it's on the back cover bird that opens chapter one. And I'll tell you where it might be soon um, in a minute when I get to the end of my little talk. Um, refocus, pick the eyes out of your thesis. I figured I had an almost guaranteed readership of 100 because I'd had 70, 76 interviewees, <coughs> two had died, 74 people would read this book, a dozen family and friends and maybe a dozen others including editors and reviewers. So I, I wasn't going for the big splash but I wanted these readers to feel so connected to the work that they would recommend it to others. So reduce, reduce scholarly apparatus, you're not re reducing, you're not, re not removing scholarship, you're removing boring old evidence of scholarship like footnotes, explanatory notes, asides and unnecessary references. Um, rewrite, be prepared to start writing all over again. As this Melbourne University Press website says, expunge, hunt down, I love these terms, hunt down and expunge academic jargon, long sentences and paragraphs, abstract nouns and passive voice. I can't stress enough the importance of self-critique. Prepare to become uncomfortable with what you previously saw as your best writing. Immerse in the detail and allow plenty of focused time. As Germano puts it, write, rethink, rewrite, see larger issues, reshape, write more, rethink more, rewrite further, repeat as necessary. I'm not trying to be scary, it's just, it's just what it took in my case. So these resources that I've discussed became my closest advisors in the absence of a supervisor, which I felt very strongly as I went into the book writing process. By sticking to the rules, my original thesis title, An Ambivalent Hospitality, Aboriginal Senior Public Servants and the Representation of Others in Australia's Self-Governing Northern Territory, eventually became Reluctant Representatives, Blackfella Bureaucrats Speak in Australia's North. I came to see my original thesis title as having been obscure and over-explaining. I didn't at the beginning, I, I thought it was very flash, but I came to see it as having been obscure and over-explaining, with the most important theme embedded too late and too passively after the column. So reluctant representatives, black fellow bureaucrats speak in Australia's North was less politically correct, for sure, but truer to the interviews, more alliterative and more active. No new research, as I said, but a new look and feel. Now I'm going to finish with three points. What the, thing, what, what, what the book has given me. Firstly, fun. It was huge, huge fun to write. It wasn't the pressure of a thesis. It was a joy. Um, I love words. I love writing. And the experience of publishing, working with Francis Morphy as the structural editor at the beginning, and later the ANG Press's wonderful copy editor and indexer, Beth Patrick, interested me in editing as my own line of work. Secondly, the book updated the research record. It promoted the experiences of some overlooked people and it firmed up my own independent voice. Thirdly, it gave me an endless supply of Christmas stocking fillers. <laughs> um, seriously, there's nothing quite like the aesthetic of a book, but it's also been excellent to offer the free download without looking for sales. Did my book achieve my goal of getting the attention of government in Canberra? Some involved in the independent review of the Australian Public Service intend that the final report due soon will quote the interviewee I quoted on the back cover blurb, for which they'll reference my book. So the answer is a possible resounding yes. And I always believe in congratulating yourself when you can, because it may not be, and then I won't be able to tell that story. <laughs> so um, the, the report comes out in a couple of well, it's due out now. The book might indeed have achieved my goal, thanks to ANU Press and those late nights and long weekends, turning my thesis into something with far greater reach that you can potentially hold. in one way or another. 
believe she can just in a sentence to, to basically explain the value of publishing a book as distinct from all of the other things that one might do with a piece of research, the value of publishing a book. Well, I think it is having that, that product in hand um, gives you some sort of closure to that enormous amount of work that you put into um, that, that particular. But I will say, and, and one of the benefits, I think, of, of going the ethos model is that those downloads, we don't know if they're, oh, well, we do, you do know if they're chapter downloads. Or but that people can take parts of, parts of that book, but you've still got that whole product um, at the end of it. I think it's another really wonderful mm -hmm. aspect of that. Well, I think for me, because I'm an old academic, getting one book done is uh, it's a relief, so I start the next. For me, I think it's sharing knowledge and insights. Ask the question again. Sorry. The value of publishing a book. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, actually, I expressed this to Joanna in the break. Um, the, book, the book continues, I can move on to other things, I can move on to other projects. And the book is now doing the, the book is now doing the work for me. Mm. Uh, well for me it's the joy and delight I see in students actually reading books and I should say that while they read them electronically, there are eight books used in the library for everyone borrow because the students collect them and you can sense in them that they're building great deep knowledge because they've got books. It's quite different to journal articles and reference books. And it gives me joy when I see that happening. Right. And if we haven't talked much about today, and I'd like to raise it, I think Jim can take a report about how we be in a position to, to say something about this, is the different types of publishers. I mean, this is a much more complex issue for someone coming out of a PhD uh, than 20 years ago, 30 years ago. I mean, when I did my PhD, it was broadly in the Australian history area. Well, I kind of began at the top, Melbourne University Press, which was the, you know, the oldest and probably uh, most prestigious. They accepted it as it turned out. Bang. Thesis, 1994, book out by mid-96. Um, that's not, that world doesn't exist really, I think, anymore in quite the same way. So I'm just, if perhaps beginning with Jim, could you say a bit about the process of choosing a, a, a publisher? I mean, there are academic presses, there are com more independent commercial presses, there are open access presses. How do we deal with this as, as someone coming out of the PhD? I mean, this is, this is not for a whole seminar. I, in my experience, what I do now is I deal with many, many presses around the world because I'm always asked to review assessed manuscripts, and that's the way I get my library now. I don't buy many books. Um, and you see such, oh, I mean, I don't deal with these predators and I don't deal with some of the lesser presses, but some of the really high prestige, high prominent presses, there's a world of difference. It's very, in the last few, let's just say last few months, a well, few weeks, I've been dealing with Burkhan, which publishes a lot on um, anthropology. Very, very good quality. The problem with Burkhan often is that you wait a long, well, let me say for all of them, you wait a long time. Um, I've been dealing fairly recently with uh, Rutledge, and Rutledge, I think standards are slipping. Um, I'm not as impressed with Rutledge. I've published with Rutledge before. Uh, Rutledge seems to me has a model that as many books as they can get out, uh, and they don't really care for the book once it's out. It's, it's thrust into the market. Um, NUS, I've been dealing with them, and in fact, I'm dealing with them right now. Uh, 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 National University of Singapore. Really quality stuff, and they've put a lot of money, a lot of effort in it, but it is a tiny show. It's a tiny show, and if you miss, I would say at the moment they're in a bit of, they have problems, they're just too small a show, uh, trying to have very high standards, uh, and they do have high standards, 
and they have very cheap books. That's the amazing thing. They produce a, a beautiful book very cheaply. And, and, but again, it's a long time, and you're dealing with a relatively small number. So th those are, and I, you know, you could go on saying Cambridge. I don't know Cambridge at the moment, um, but it, it's a world of diverse kinds of publishers. But the one thing, and the one thing I didn't mention in my, in my talk is that the publishing, academic publishing world is in, in chaos. It is in turmoil, it's in conflict, and there is a struggle going on. And presses change very rapidly, um, and not all presses have multi-million dollar, well, Oxford, Cambridge, and, and Harvard, for example, have million dollar, multi-million dollar endowments uh, to, uh, to support them. An entirely different world from some of the smaller commercial presses. I was saying I was wearing your Academy of Humanities hat to comment on the trade publisher, the commercial publisher. Now you have some very eminent uh, fellows, including I mean, one thinks here, Ian McKelman, former president of the Academy, uh, who have published trade publishers, um, Penguin and so on, as I do, um, a small one, Penguin, but nonetheless a trade publisher. Could you say a little about where they stand, do you think, in terms of I suppose, it, it esteem uh, in terms of uh, value within a humanities context. Yeah, it's interesting you, you uh, raise it. He was one of, the, one of the people that really was a terrific source of advice um, in terms of going to publishers. He was the one who said to me, you know, you could go the Oxford Cambridge route, you know, it's a British history sort of run. There was another uh, series at the time. But I think it was coming out the back of got me to think seriously about paying the press um, because of that reach, um, that broad reach that I can get through um, those networks. Uh, it's interesting with it in terms of because uh, election to the Academy is, you know, is um, a really rigorous process through peer review and, and what have you, but as the Executive Director I'm delightfully excluded from a lot of that um, process actually. It, it does it's run through uh, one part of the academy and through fellows and it's highly confidential and what have you. So I guess I'm not as immersed in, in the sorts of um, criteria for election and, and how much those different uh, prestige, the prestige of the publisher comes into play. I think it differs across different fields, um, potentially, because um, there's 11 different, uh, different uh, disciplinary sections within the academy. Um, but uh, I think in terms of seeing those, um, you know, people like Ian and, and yourself are models for, you know, that the, there are other avenues to publish your work, and particularly if you um, and, and, and can tell a story, and I think that's the other, the beauty of a book, it allows you to develop a story over a long term, that you can't really do in a journal article so much. Um, uh, so if, if your work is recognised, that 
choice. Presumably, there's the high chance that these can be very good outcomes, um, quite a significant impact. But if you don't actually take the time to tell that second story, it could fall flat. It could be just a missed opportunity. But I'd also just like to um, comment on something that Jim said. So Jim's had the experience of publishing at, at Routledge. I have too. I would actually, even though we're in totally different disciplines, I'm in theater, Jim's in anthropology, I would say that my experience is almost exactly the same as his in Routledge. But in a lot of those publishers, it varies hugely from discipline to discipline. So it may be in your discipline that right now, Routledge is the best place to publish. Um, so you do need to take, not what we're saying with a grain of salt, you still need to do the research for your discipline. Likewise, there are publishers out there that I'd, you know, someone reading applications at the ARC, I'd say, gosh, why did they publish there? And then I read in their application that their XYZ Press is the best for that for discipline. I didn't know that until they told me that. It's a classic with something like you know, University of Y Press, which we know is, is you know, very one of the great, the great presses in the world in Asian Pacific yeah. so, so Liverpool University Press, going since the 1890s, very strong in, in labour and social history. So, you know, um, and the applicant may know that, some of the people reading an application may know that. Chances are some of the people reading it will not know it. It's yeah. better to say too much in that regard than not say enough. Can I just jump in there and say that the other one thing I think that is shifting that our academy is beginning to look at, and I know um, some people at the ANU are looking at, is this shifting notions of academic excellence and what is an indicator of academic mm. excellence, mm. Um, uh, particularly to us, sort of digital outputs. Um, but also, I think the you know, there's now an impact and engagement exercise that's run through the ARC as well as the excellence. So it's, it's I think that whole space is it's beginning to shift a little bit. Whether that will change the emphasis on the prestige of the publisher, I don't know. Yeah, the whole issue of impact and engagement is a very interesting one to connect to some of the things we've been talking about. And I think this is probably the moment to bring in Elizabeth. Because I mean, you were talking about a very a particular and much valued kind of impact, and that is policy impact. And I'm just, if you could comment about, um, you know, the choices you made in that context. I mean, was that really important for you? Um, was that in your press, um, the direction you went because of that interest in, in having that policy? It was, it was really a lot to do with where I was in Cape mm -hmm. and the monograph series, and ANU, ANU Press is the publisher of the monograph series. So once I had the book draft, <coughs> At that point, I became aware, it was also innocence, <laughs> I became aware when I had a draft that I could go somewhere else. And I did, for a moment, think about that. A moment, I thought about producing a $150 book. And I just, it was only a moment. I just sort of, I, I really wanted, I felt loyal to the ANU. Um, and, I, and I felt loyal to Cape at the Visiting Fellowship and to the support that I'd had. And there was this, there was just a, a process into a new press and I, I couldn't see any reason to go wider because I, as I say, I wasn't, I wasn't looking for that ambitious, I, I wasn't looking, um, I wasn't looking for more than impact, national policy impact and it seemed the best. It, so did I really, did I think ANU Press has national policy impact? Not not really, but it's ANU, it probably does, and... Um, and it's open, it's open access. It's to open access. So the open access issue, so for this, um, that's been an incredible boon. I have, at the beginning I resented it a bit. I, I sort of wanted a book, I didn't want to have, so I bought all the books at the beginning. I had some more funding put on paper. I bought a bunch of books. I sent them to the interviewees. So I had, buy all the books and I had to do all my own promotion, just uh, launch it in the Northern Territory and a little subsidiary moment here. But, uh, um, so one of, so um, the online, the, being able to send it around to people, put it on my email address as something that I was, people say, I'm going to buy the book because I want you to get something back from it. And I go, 
just don't, they don't, nobody cares anymore, which I think is a bit sad. Mm. Um, my hairdresser's about to buy one. And um, <laughs> she just, that's she just that's won't that's be that's convinced. That's 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 convinced that's 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 that I won't benefit from it. So <laughs> I've bought it for her and I'm selling it. I'm not selling it to her and uh, we're all I still have a magic as objects, I think. But um, I think some yeah. of, also it's been my being located in the government and having an internal, being able to do some promotion within government and with people. So I think that's been really useful. Also being in at the university as a public servant. So there's been a lot of crossover kind of uh, opportunities there. I just want to ask one more question before we go to the, the floor. Um, probably for Roxanne and Jim, but um, what else? Um, the, the changes at Melbourne University Press that occurred some months ago, which you know signalled a really um, important shift in direction uh, with implications, I think, for, for the, the, certainly the national scene. I wonder if, if, if you might comment on those and, and their implications for, for, for academic publishing more generally in Australia, perhaps particularly for A&E Press. Do you have thoughts on this? Maybe I'll make some comments. I've had public spats with their CEO in the past, so I feel free to say this. I think it's really important that scholarly publishers are scholarly publishers. Uh, there were a lot of um, moves at Melbourne University just to become trade, to become more, uh, more widely uh, visible, and absolutely there are many different sorts of publishers and trade publishers are in that business. Was probably concerning when I saw that the, all the reports that none of their top ten books were written by any scholars. They were funding you know, criminals and drug lords to write biographies. And uh, yes, there was a space for that, but is that the space of the scholarly publisher? Not in my view. Unless the criminals and drug lords are in the university. <laughs> 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 I'm writing scholarly books about the impact of drugs on society. <laughs> Um, I've had a big impact here. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess it seems to me that university presses need to define their missions. Ours is very much around social science and the humanities and making a difference by communicating those ideas. And I think that uh, speaks to the role of the Australian National University as the national university, um, really communicating in line with our vision with a particular role, which you can see in our founding principles, to Asia and Pacific and to actually seek to do uh, social and intellectual good. Thanks, Roxanne. Jim, did you just briefly just just a, just, a, just a comment and a little looking back, when we set up the ANU Press as an ANU e-press originally, that was the title, I think we made, and that was 2003, we set it up, first publications came up, I think we made a huge jump a huge leap in the academic publishing world. And frankly, though it's not fully recognized, that was the benchmark. And slowly other academic publishers are inching their way reluctantly to an ANU model. Ultimately, the ANU model will dominate, I think. I'm fairly confident, uh, because we're in a digital world and that's the way things will happen. Now, some presses have embraced that further, gone further than others. Uh, some have, are really not calling it an A and U model, but taken up that model. But that's the way we're going. University yeah, UCL press, so yeah. a very good example. Yeah. Of the of uh, look, thank you um, for that. That was um, a terrific uh, panel discussion. Um, to the floor, uh, questions, comments um, from from anyone about any aspect of today's uh, discussion. Um, I'd like to ask you all about.
what have you discovered since you published through a press as uh, the, the press that would give you maximum policy impact now if you publish? So a couple of specific questions, but a very general concern about what to do with interdisciplinary thesis and publication forward. Seen overseas. I mean, you know, Oxford, Cambridge, those names are known everywhere. Um, 
may use names certainly known internationally, but I was just wondering, do you have any ideas about, you know, is that is there a form of snobbery still there about open access book publishing as opposed to journal publishing? Is this rapidly changing? Well, they're heading in the same direction, aren't they? I mean, I think Cambridge certainly has an open access. Yep, Cambridge yeah. and Springer have had yeah. open access. Uh, Springer claims to have 300 titles. What is changing in Europe is this, I don't know if you've heard about Program S or Project yeah, S. So a lot of the funders have got together, particularly led by Max Planck, to say, OK, if we're funding research, we're funding the whole of research, people should not be having to pay in other ways. And the current model is publishers get a bit of money through charging authors, they charge libraries, they charge, you know, the person walking past the window, and it's a it's a mess. And to a degree it was made a mess by UK policy interventions where the UK government actually paid for article processing fees, created an industry where fifty percent of the costs went on administrative overhead. It's it's been a an undesirable state. Um, I was going to say other words, but I won't. So really leading from Europe is program is, which is not making great headway in Europe, and I know the ARC and NHMRC are watching it. So they will use a new and a different model to open access, but I think the open access movement has reached maturity, that it is accepting of different models, and sometimes those models will change. So University of Adelaide Press changed, Monash closed, Monash University is maybe some hybrids, some open access, some closed access, but I think the largest change on the policy landscape will be through programmers. And presumably the, R with the REF in Britain, so the yep. British equivalent for the era, has mandated open access, including for monographs, right? It, it's coming for monographs, so the only monographs that will be considered for REF will be ones that are open yeah. access. And Cambridge say it's about 10% of their titles yeah. that are REF appropriate. Lots of the other ones are not REF appropriate. Yeah. So the change is coming. Frank, can I just yes. make a point that um, if you receive ARC funding, it is expected that your books will be somehow available on an open access platform. It doesn't stipulate what that is. Well, I, just made, I just make the point about the ANU Press is when we started in the first few years, the majority of downloads were Australia and New Zealand. That's shifted. Now the majority, the overwhelming majority are from overseas. And that's the recognition that you want when people are coming to your site and downloading. Question. Yes. Uh, just wondering if people could comment on publishing controversial issues. should be encouraged. <laughs> Could you give an example, perhaps? Uh, well, in, um, in, in, in indigenous topics where there may be different sides to an issue, or um, where, it, where, it could, where it has the potential to create more conflict, but it's an issue, it's an important issue to some, but it could I don't know how to answer it, but I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, but this goes back to the thesis. I, I, years ago, I supervised a thesis by a student now, and she's now a professor in Perth. And it was on a, a elite, an elite ruling class, an elite group in Bali. And she had devoted an entire chapter, it's one of the best chapters I've ever read, on the sexual exploits of the whole group. But it was of such potential risk, huh? because if it were ever even, that we had to cut it out. She still has that chapter, this very sexiest chapter, but it wasn't in the thesis. I mean, you, we, you can't, there are certain things, you know, you have to say, whoa, huh? the, the, the amount of trouble and lawsuits that will come from that. I mean, I, I believed every word she was, and it was very graphic, uh, but it, didn't belong in the thesis. And it may be one of those things that you need to take a lot of people's advice mm -hmm. about supervisors, other people in the field, and the press themselves, because 
Yeah, I, I had a chapter that had to be taken out once because the press wasn't willing to wear the possibility of a lawsuit. The lawsuit, yeah. So, two comments. Um, one device I used was I used the interviewees, my interviewees' voices to say things that it was difficult for me to say. Um, and I think that is, yeah, so if, that, if that's open to you, that's always a good thing. Um, so working out how to step back and let the voices of research, the participants speak, um, is part of, part of an answer. Another thing is that I did sometimes uh, get uh, controversial information, like sometimes people spoke about each other. Um, and I didn't use any of that. So a mixture of, I think you can always, you can generally always find a way of saying things. Um, so, I mean, but if, if you can't, if it's going to hurt people or, yeah, I just, yeah, you, you cut it out there. Yeah, no, I was just wondering, from the publisher's point of view, if right. they're interested in, that's something that they find. Because it goes through waves sometimes. It's popular to publish certain things or in certain oh. areas, and other times it's not. Well, from the press's point of view, from Amy Press's point of view, we want really good, high quality sculpture. That is the most important principle. Everything will go through peer review processes, and we're not looking for sensation. Um, we're not afraid of taking through the good evaluative processes uh, a title that may have some controversy, whether it's about drinking culture or whatever. It's the quality of the research that is the most important to the publishers. And I think that's pretty universal through good publishers. And it's becoming really important, isn't it, to have policies and structures in place for the press to ensure that, that space for academic freedom is, is carved out, because we know that there are a number of pressures operating now uh, internationally that, that can uh, end up uh, producing censorship. Um, and dangerous, of course, also self-censorship. Um, yeah. Can I just re-ask the question I asked before around um, if you are going to publish, so say that's that's happening, um, the, who do you get advice if you then want to carve up some of that content into journal articles? Um, is that allowed? Is that like that? Or, kind of or once you've republished, like once you've published yeah. in one domain, can you then use that work? So every publisher that you submit to, and I, I just submitted an article to a Taylor & Francis journal last week, we'll have a form. It will say in the form, you need to say, well in this case the Taylor & Francis one, have you published this elsewhere? Have you submitted that to any other publisher? And sometimes it will be different for each journal, but the publishers, when you look at uh, that, will have those requirements that you need to declare whether you have done that or not, and then they will make a decision based on their policies, but it's up to you to make those declarations. Sure, but it is, it's an option. It's not a... It's not, you can't proceed in the, in the form without filling it in and... No, no, sorry, it. yeah, but it, it's not just a standard, no, if you published a book, you can't use that content now for general articles. Well, so it'd if be a standard note those from processes, yeah. 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 You shouldn't just take yeah. a chapter out yeah. and send it to someone else, yeah. that's not very... Yeah. Yeah. No, no, yeah. that's... Yeah. Self-plagiarism is a thing. Yeah. Yeah. And it's yeah. not a good thing. It's no, not something not you want to be associated yes. with. So if you are publishing new well, material that has already been published, you don't do it. You don't want to. No. There's a certain it comes back to haunt you. Yeah. It comes yes. back to haunt you. Yeah. Yeah. There's a certain academic type you say, oh, that put yeah. And publish the same book exactly. 40 times, you say. You know. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean there is recycling does go on, but it's it's problematic. It's more common the other way around, isn't it, where people do a lot of articles. Uh, and then a book comes out and yes. it actually looks like just a, a bunch of articles. That's a dangerous practice. I mean, I've heard it, I know, I was talking before to Daniel, I know of at least one case where someone actually lost a contract because they published too much in, in various article forms. And the publisher, um, not surprisingly, said, well, they're all out there already, accessible in every university library that has subscriptions to Taylor and Francis or whatever. Why would we publish this? And, and they actually revoked the contract. So. It is yeah, certainly. I mean, there may be differences across disciplines, but certainly in mine, it's it's a, a, a yeah, it's, it's dangerous territory. Can I just ask why? What, what are you trying to achieve? 
are these different, different rich, different audiences. Yeah. So the examiner says, go and public, turn this straight into a book. Sorry. The examiner said, go and turn this straight into a book. And then they've said, but these are the articles you could do as well. And obviously, it's so they've given you a choice. You can do one. So or it's the a other. choice, yeah. not a do both. Mm -hmm. seen a book that will say you know, an earlier version of chapter four appeared in and sometimes you do depending on the agreement you'll need the uh, um, agreement of the original publisher which I'll, I think probably give um, so that, that's more common I think. Um, I, I assess the, the, an article for publication by the journal Oceania um, two weeks ago where the author had left Refer back in this chapter, and you realize where this is coming, coming right where it come from. <laughs> and you have to, you have to, as a reviewer or an assessor, you have to say, well, this looks like uh, uh, an excerpt from a, a, a thesis. I think yes. And I must want to comment. You have to be careful what you published in your blog, as well. I submitted a paper to an international conference the other day. And it was rejected before it got to a reviewer because it had indexed my blog where I'd taken notes for the article. And um, so academics are encouraged to blog things, but you've got to take into account what's in there as well. Frank, can we just say something about the policy? Roxanne, of course, as University Librarian, all the organisations who've sponsored today. Um, to thank everyone uh, for their participation. Um, you can't have these events unless um, you have an audience, unless you have participants, um, uh, and you've all been participants. Thank you to all of our speakers um, for some really, I think we covered an enormous sort of array of, of topics and it's incredibly valuable, I think, to have such a, a variety of different experiences and backgrounds because uh, this is, as I said, it's such a complex area now that, you know, I've, as I mentioned, I, I publish in, in a, with a small um, independent publisher in Melbourne called Black Ink, and um, I've had, you know, PhD students coming to the end of uh, their studies saying, oh, should, should, I, should I publish with a, um, should I publish with Black Ink, they might sometimes ask me, or should I publish with a, a, a commercial publisher like Scribe or New South or whatever? And the answer I always give is that it depends. It depends, you know, because there are so many variables. And so the, the importance that I think all of the, the speakers emphasise about having those networks of advisors and, and uh, you know, that there isn't a single authority that you can go to for any of this. It's really important that you, you seek different kinds of advice and that you also, I think, develop the, the expertise and the confidence um, to be able to weigh up that advice because um, it will be in, inevitably of varying quality. Um, so develop those networks, but also you know, it's really important, I think, to, to develop your own independent expertise. And, and, and we all need that kind of expertise. It's a part of our professional training 
um, within a discipline, really, to, to, to gain an understanding of the publishing and scholarly context in which we operate. And again, you know, um, so innocent 25 or 30 years ago about this, mainly because it was such a, it was a much simpler system, I think, in, in, in terms of the way things operated. Um, technological change, institutional change, all these sorts of things have produced something much more complex. And I think um, it, it just underlines the importance of, of developing those, those networks and different sources of advice. I'd also like to go back to something Roxanne said, um, the importance of really just not giving up, of being persistent. Um, you know, easy to forget this sort of stuff, but, uh, you know, I've always said any um, academic who tells you they've never had anything knocked back or never been knocked back for a job is almost certainly fitting. Um, you know, and, and sometimes really successful books, um, it takes a while to find the right publisher for them. Um, it's certainly been my experience. I mentioned before that it was an easy experience in terms of the thesis, but I'll tell you what, the next one wasn't easy. Uh, I published a book that I thought was pretty good, really. It took me about eight years to write on and off. Sex Lives of Australians, a history. It eventually, you know, it was shortlisted for virtually every prize in the country. It, uh, you know, it got it won a prize and all the rest of it. But it was knocked back by three publishers um, before I got to a fourth one that kind of undenied for a while because they thought it might be a bit long for them. I think they even recommended I go and speak to Tina, maybe, because you've got a publication <laughs> subsidy system. Uh, and, and then a fifth one sort of came into view and I've been publishing with them ever since. Um, you know, so um, sometimes, I mean, there are going to be disappointments along the way, but the importance, I think, of, of persistence, of, again, drawing on those networks. I was very fortunate in having good advice on the way through that. You know, people said, well, you know, maybe that wasn't the one to go to. Have you tried such and such? Um, and sometimes it can be quite, I mean, in the end, the one I went to, which just turned out to be a terrific publisher from my point of view, it almost happened accidentally. And so, you know, just being open, I think, to that sort of possibility. We, there's, there's a process, I mean, the story, I think, that Joanne was talking about earlier about, you know, what's the story of you as a, a researcher is immensely important, isn't it, when putting together ARC applications. But we also, we all retrofit. We all retrofit, that is, we, we you know, this publisher eventually decided to go for your book and therefore you kind of retrofit a story around that outcome and that's certainly what I've, I've done and I think what all of us probably tend to do. There's a kind of coherence in retrospect, isn't there, with a lot of this stuff. But that's, a part, that's a part of being able to operate, I think, successfully, whether it's as an academic or uh, you know, within some other context in which you're doing research and using the research that, you do, that you've done as a, as a PhD student. Um, so look, um, thank you to everyone.